to everybody. It's hard to believe that we've actually reached the halfway stage of this present series, uh, and particularly the latest lecture series. And this evening, we'd like to welcome John Reynolds, who was a guard station a sergeant in Temple Moore College. And John is going to speak to us on the World War I period, when 1914-15 we had some German prisoners of war in what we would be familiar with as the Guard of the College. But uh, that was an interesting part of its history. So I hand you over to John. Thank you very much, Brendan. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hopefully, it's, you can hear me with the microphone here. Um, first, I'd like to say thanks for coming out on a cold, wet December night just before Christmas to attend the lecture this evening. As Mary said, my name is John Reynolds, and I'm based at the Garda College as a trading sergeant. And despite what you might think, it is still open, and we're still open for business. Um, I also set up the Garda College Museum in 2002 because, uh, as Mary said, there's a wonderful history and heritage in the town of Tampamore and in the Garda College itself, going back to the stages of Richmond Barracks. And I'm just in the final stages of, of completing a PhD in history in the University of Liverpool, so I definitely have the book uh, fairly bad in terms of history. Now, my talk this evening is slightly different to the one that was named on, on the flyer there, and it's actually called Barbed Wire Disease. Uh, and it's a study really of the period of 1914 and 15 when the, uh, the college was used to house over 2,300 German prisoners of war. The expression barbed wire disease was first used around 1915 by a Dr. A. L. Fisher, who was attached to the Swiss Embassy in London. At that stage, Switzerland, uh, well, Switzerland remained neutral during the entire First World War, but it was requested by both the German and British governments to act as an intermediary in, in terms of prisoner welfare under the Hague and Geneva Conventions. So consequently, Dr. Fisher visited lots of German prisoners of war in various camps around England. Um, he never came over here, but he, he actually wrote a book at the time called Barbed Wire Disease, and it's, it's really used to signify the psychological problems experienced by uh, prisoners that are detained for long periods in PLW camps. And it's actually still a term that's in use today uh, for people that are prisoners of war for prolonged periods. Uh, my interest in this particular subject came about a few years ago when I was over in Polly's pub there one, one lunchtime um, having a sandwich, and I saw this photograph on the wall. And um, anyone, anyone familiar with Polly's or with Temple Moore know that it's the local pub just outside the gates of the college. But I looked at the photograph and I recognised what appeared to be to be buildings in the college. And also, obviously, to me, German soldiers in the First World War period. So this was a bit of a surprise to me because I had no idea that uh, we had German prisons in Templemore at that period. So I asked around locally and I did a bit of uh, digging on it. And uh, I, I was just fascinated at the notion that in 1914 there were thousands of German prisoners sitting in the middle of what is now the Garda College. So I, I've carried out a lot of research since then and found out some really interesting items that I'll bring to you. I, I've also been struck not just with this particular story, but a lot of things that happened in Temple Moor, how they were connected with events on the national stage and also sometimes on the world stage, and I'll deal with some of those later on as well. For me, the, the interest in history really comes about from the individual stories. I mean, there were 2,300 people there, but to me, um, I wanted to know, well, what happened to these, these men? Um, how did they end up in Temple Moor? What happened while they were there? And what happened after they left? And for me, it's those individual stories and the artifacts and the, the items associated with these people or any people uh, that really make the history come alive for me. And I also remind, um, when, back in the days when we had new recruits at the college, I would always give them a talk on the history of policing in Ireland and where we came from, how come we're unarmed and we're called the Garda Shikon and stuff like that. <clears throat> and uh, I, was, I was always keen to remind the students that despite what they might think, they were not the first people to be kept against their will at Temple Moor, as this photograph proves. <laughs> Um, the first slide here relates to, it's called Enemy Aliens. And from the time that Temple Moor first opened in 1814, it was constructed between 1809 and it opened in 1814. And I got a copy of the Barrick accounts at the time, and uh, it shows that the Barracks was built for £42,500 and it came in £500 on the budget. So they certainly knew how to build them back then. Uh, and over the years, every regiment of the British Army served in, uh, in, in Temple Moor. And on numerous occasions were several regiments there together. It was, a, it was a training garrison, so I've had people there from all over the world that will say that seven generations ago 
their grandfather and this, but he walked from Tumi Barber and joined the regiment in Templemore, whatever happened to be there, and then went off around the world. So it, there's a wonderful heritage in the barracks itself, but by 1909, the barracks had been vacated and was locked up and was empty. And interestingly enough, despite what people might think that um, it was a great thing to have the barracks closed and the soldiers gone, that wasn't the case. The town council wrote to the war office in 1909 pleading that soldiers would be sent back to Temple Moor. And I suppose it has, it has a resonance today that the town has always been linked for prosperity with the occupants of Richmond Barracks. But the war office wrote back in 1909 and said that there is no prospect of troops being quartered there in the near future. Uh, but obviously the outbreak of the Great War in August 1914 brought about a change in that policy. Richmond was quickly identified as a very suitable location to detain German prisoners of war and also civilians that were interned on the outbreak of war in August 1914. The reason why it was so suitable is that it was deemed to be an inland town with limited traffic connections and limited possibilities of escape. So even if prisoners did manage to break out of the place, they really couldn't go anywhere, and that's the reason why it was chosen. Plus it was a large military barracks, it was already fortified, and it, it made a very sensible location. There was a train station in the town, so the prisoners could be brought straight down from Dublin, marched to the barracks, and then kept in, in secure custody. Um, as I said, at the outbreak of the war, the government brought in a policy, which is it's something that's not very well known, but it's a, a very interesting and sad part of, of history, really. The, the British government decided to intern anybody that was deemed to be German, Hungarian or Austrian of military age. So any, any fit man who could um, have joined the military was interned. This happened throughout Britain and Ireland. And 300 civilians were rounded up immediately and brought to Temple Moor. They were rounded up all over the country. They were brought to regional bases by the OIC and then brought to, initially, to Temple Moor. And it might sound very drastic, a lot of these men had lived here for years, they were married men with families, they were taken away from their families, arrested and interned without a charge, uh, and a lot of them didn't get out until the war was actually over. And it's a very um, a very sad uh, part of history, I mean, a very little known part of history. And the reason behind this is what was called, I suppose you could call it spy fever. When the war began, and, and the, the, the war with Germany had been coming for a long time, so this spy fever had prevailed for many years. And unfortunately, all foreigners, or deemed to be foreigners, were viewed with suspicion. And one example I can give you is the case of the man from Capamor. In October 1914, the Tipperary Star reported on the curious case of the man from Capamor. It said that a, a burly man called Roger Bazaine O'Kennedy was in a public house in Henry Street. There's always a pub name for these stories. And he was talking about Germany and how many soldiers were in the Tipperary area. The patrons reported him to the police. And he was arrested for suspected espionage. But the local sergeant in Capamor states that he knew the man very well and there was nothing against him. So he was then released. So basically, because he was talking about troop movements and he had a strange accent, he was arrested on suspicion of being a spy. And there are numerous similar stories about that throughout the country. Um, the policy of internment meant that, as I said, 300 civilians were brought to Camp Moore and interned in Richmond. But when the first batch of military prisoners arrived in Temple Moor in September 1914, it was decided that it was a bad thing to have civilian internees and military prisoners uh, mixing together. So it was decided to move all of the civilians to Old Castle in County Meath to a disused workhouse, and this is a sketch of it taken at the time. And eventually all the civilians were moved to Old Castle. Um, the story of the Old Castle camp is really interesting in its own right, and the local historical society there I've been in touch with, and they've done a lot of research. And, Obviously, we have a certain connection between the two towns because of that. I did find one particular connection uh, with Temple Moor. In 1915, two civilians escaped from the camp. One of them was called Carol Morline. Now, he'd been a merchant seaman, and he had the misfortune that his ship happened to be in Irish ports when the war broke out and he was arrested and detained. But he escaped from the camp, and he was subsequently arrested in Cavan by the Royal Irish Constabulary. He was dressed as a priest. And when he was questioned by the police, he said that he was a Reverend White from Temple Moor. So there was a connection. Uh, the police found out and reported that both men had plenty of money and maps, and they strongly suspected that they had escaped with the assistance of local Sinn Féin activists, including a Mr. Charles Fox, who was a close associate of Arthur Griffith. Um, Fox was arrested and detained in Arbor Hill for a while, but there were no charges preferred, and he returned to Old Castle to a hero's welcome. So the connections between Germany and the Sinn Féin or the volunteer movements are very interesting and are, and are directly linked to what happened at the Temple Moor camp 
and I'll come back to that later on during the talk. Some of the cases behind the civilian detainees before I move on to the military prisons are really sad and very interesting, and I'd like to bring you a couple of examples about this pretty forgotten part of Irish history. This man was called Louis John, and he was a musician in the Everyman Theatre in Cork in 1914, but when the war broke out, he was refused a new contract by the theatre manager because he was now categorised as an enemy alien. So he was not allowed to be employed and he had to be arrested and interned by the RIC. The theatre manager was compelled to hand him over to the police. So Louis was initially sent to McCroom, which was the staging area for all enemy aliens in Cork, uh, and then he was sent to Templemore. Uh, Louis' <coughs> wife lived in Cheltenham in the UK with three children, all under five years of age. She wrote numerous letters uh, to the two politicians, including this one, uh, pleading with the War Office and politicians to release her husband because she was destitute. She, she ended up having to receive charity from the Board of Guardians, which we're all too familiar with in an Irish context. But she stated that she now had no food or fuel from the fire. And then she went on to say that she was excluded from receiving charity because of her nationality. And uh, her letters had no effect, however, and Louis Jo remained in detention for the duration of the war. And there are numerous cases like that in Ireland and England. Another man detained in Templemore was called Herman Horlacher, a butcher from Dunleary or Kingstown as it was known at the time. Um, Herman Horlacher had lived in Ireland for many years uh, and really was, was an Irish citizen at that stage, but still, when war broke out, he became a suspect. And there's a really interesting file in this case in the National Archives, which I, I dug out recently. Herman was arrested in the September 1914 by the Dublin Metropolitan Police and handed over to the military. He was then sent down to Templemore was released in October because two what were termed respectable businessmen, as named here, James Dowling and Bernard Carroll, they effectively signed a surety for him, or, or you could say went bail for him. They signed a bond in the amount of £50 pounds each, which was a lot of money in 1914, and that was to ensure that they would, they would uh, make certain that Horlacher would be of good behaviour, as was termed, for the duration of the war. In the case of this one as well, there was a petition that was signed by a lot of prominent business people and residents in Kingstown all testifying that they knew Herman Horlacher and that he was of good character. So Herman Horlacher was actually released and I suppose in contrast to the last case it shows clearly that if you had connections and if you had some money uh, that could make the difference between staying in custody and being released. This uh, wonderful letter again which has a more connections it was written by the camp commandant and the stamp is up there from uh, camp commandant POW camp Templemore. Um, it was written and it shows that Horlacher was released with orders to report to the Dublin Metropolitan Police in Kingstown and sign on as an enemy alien. But however, Herman wasn't off the hook quite yet. In May 1915, the infamous G Division of the DLP, who were the political police, they received information that caused them to reopen the file on Herman Horlacher. They received this letter from a man called Mr Manning, who lived in the Royal Mail Hotel, also in Kingstown. Manning alleged that when the German fleet had docked in Kingstown in 1910, two senior officers, including an admiral, had gone to Horlacher's shop carrying what he termed a dispatch box, and that Horlacher had supplied the fleet with meat and other supplies. So effectively, they went shopping. But still, um, Mr. Manning wrote to the, the G Division and said that this was a suspect, even though it was four years previously. And I think that it shows the, the level of spy fever I mentioned earlier on that the G-men took this information so seriously. Uh, there was a certain amount of paranoia towards anybody at the moment that was of, of any sort of deed to foreign extraction. But nonetheless, uh, the police came to the conclusion uh, with the wonderful expression that Horlacher presented a danger to the realm. So he was kept under surveillance by, by the G-men. Incidentally, a G-division of the Dublin Metropolitan Police was the famous unit that was wiped out by Michael Collins' squad during the War of Independence. Another interesting aside, I suppose, is the fact that Irish immigrants uh, to the US, USA brought the expression over with them to refer to FBI agents. And if you've seen old gangster movies and the um, gangsters are talking about the G-men, they're actually referring to Irish, uh, they're referring to FBI agents. And that came over from Irish immigrants because we had a lot of Irish gangsters that went to America. And uh, the final case that I'd like to refer to before I come on to the military side is this case of Albert Bezler. Uh, again, obviously there was a big German enclave because he also lived in Kingstown. The DMP received this letter from the Liverpool City Police containing allegations, and you'll like this bit, that he was living beyond his means and that his wife's sister was...
and that his wife's sister was married to a German officer. So, certainly as a policeman, I'd consider that to be very flimsy evidence, but you could also say that it's a good old case of Irish begrudgery. Um, but it was still sufficient to cause Belcher to be arrested and in turn for the duration of the war. And I suppose um, the way things are at the moment, if, if living against your living beyond your means was an offence, well, maybe most of us would be locked up. So that brings me to the arrival of the first prisoners in Templemore. Um, at that stage, the civilians had gone to Old Castle and Templemore became exclusively a military camp. I did mention earlier on also that there was a regularly connection between Templemore and events on the world stage, and this is one such example. Um, some of the first POWs that arrived in Templemore have been involved when the very first shots of the Great War were fired. Um, and it relates to an engagement between these two ships, HMS Amphion of the Royal Navy and the Coney and Louisa, which was a German Navy ship. Um, earlier in the morning of the 6th of August 1914, the war was only 32 hours old. The Royal Navy ship hit a German mine in the North Sea, which had been laid by the Coney and Louisa. And this account that I'm going to give now is contained in the Royal Navy archives. It said that at 2300 on the August the 4th, England declared war in, war in Germany. In anticipation of this, the Coney and Louisa, a former ferry which operated on the Hamburg-Holland route, had been converted into a mine layer by the German Navy. On the 6th of August, the German ship was sighted by HMS Amphion and two other ships, HMS Lance and HMS Landrail, gave chase. HMS Lance opened fire on the Coney and Louisa and is credited with firing the first shots of the Great War. The German ship was hit several times and began to sink, and 46 of the 100 crew of Germans were rescued by the Royal Navy ship HMS Amphion. But in a cruel twist, which often happens in war, HMS Amphion hit a mine when it was returning to port, which had been laid by the Coney and Louisa, and it exploded. 151 British sailors were killed along with uh, 19 of the Germans who had been rescued. So the irony there is that these 19 sailors were killed by a mine that they had laid themselves. Uh, and those, um, the remaining prisoners were actually some of the first prisoners that came to Templemore. So it said they were connected with the first shots of the Great War were actually fired. As you can imagine now, the arrival of the POWs in Templemore generated a lot of interest locally and nationally. The magazine of the Royal Irish Constabulary commented that the POWs were received with much cordiality with the local townspeople because of course they'd been campaigning to have the barracks reopened and as well as it didn't matter if it was British soldiers or German prisoners the town was going to benefit from it. Um, the prisoners arrived in Dublin at, on specially chartered vessels landing at the North Wall. They were then taken he under heavy guard by the Leinster Regiment by train straight down to Templemore and then they marched up to the barracks. When they arrived at the town the newspapers made the comments as shown here it was described that they had a very crestfallen appearance and that utter dejection seemed to have fallen upon them, which is, I suppose is understandable. They had been captured in battle. Up to 50 of the soldiers had been badly wounded as well and had serious injuries. But there was an 80 bed military hospital in Richmond Barracks and they were looked after there. Um, while marching to the barracks from the railway station, one prisoner was heard to ask a local publican to get me a pint. And the local newspaper interpreted this as a sign that the new arrivals had mastered the subtleties of the Viera. So they had settled in very, very quickly to their new home in Ireland. And within two weeks, over 2,300 prisoners had arrived in Richmond. The two front squares of the, of the barracks were divided into large compounds, four of them in total. Each had high observation towers surrounded by machine guns and searchlights. The entire camp was surrounded by barbed wire and patrolling centres from the 3rd Denster Regiment. The prisoner, and I suppose people, uh, when they think of the Great War, they think of trench warfare. But before that developed, which was really early in 1915, there were large, uh, huge scale battles taking place on open ground in France and Belgium between the Germans, the French, and the British, including cavalry regiments. So there were an awful lot of prisoners captured on both sides. It was only several months into the war, both sides dug in, and then that led to the, the horrors of the trenches, as we were familiar with. So that's why, on the German side too, there were many thousands of prisoners captured in the opening battles of the Great War. The men that came to Templemore were captured in battles, including the Battle of Mons and the Battle of the Oyne. There was also a detachment of the elite Ulan cavalry, as well as the soldiers, or the sailors I mentioned earlier on. Um, the next three slides here, these were taken, or they're sketches of a POW camp 
that was done on the island of Jersey for German prisoners in World War I, but it must have been quite a similar scene to the huts that were built in the Temple War because they were to a standard design. Um, this is another photograph from Jersey showing the huts being constructed, the wooden frames and huts being built. And then this is a watercolour done by one of the prisoners of the Jersey POW camp, which you can see is done on quite a huge scale. And outside you have the barracks for these soldiers that were there in them. But it would have been quite similar to what you would have seen in Temple War at the time. Um, this photograph, which I mentioned earlier on, uh, shows three distinct uniforms uh, that can be identified for the military story in the bunch of You have the normal tunic of the German soldier. Over here you have the double-breasted tunic of the cavalryman. And also, as I mentioned earlier on, the sailors who have been on the Coney and Louisa. And these photographs from museums illustrate the uniforms a bit better. You've got the um, regular uniform, naval uniforms, the double-breasted tunic, the famous, what's called the Felmut, sort of pork pie hat, as the British soldiers call it, and of course, I suppose the most recognisable of all, the spiked helmet or pickle helmet, uh, worn by German soldiers. The regiments that were in Tampa Moor, uh, I've identified several of them that were there, they came from Brandenburg, Hanover, and um, various other regiments. And this is very useful when you're trying to track down where the men came from, uh, because it gives you some geographical idea for where the regiments came. One of the regiments, which is this one, the 35th of Brandenburg, this photograph was taken on a training camp just before the war broke out. And so it's quite possible that some of the men in this photograph ended up as prisoners in Temple Moor only a few weeks after the photograph was taken. One paper commented on the arrival of the prisoners and it said that it was going to break in life on the town. And um, you had a curious situation where local people would come up to look in the fences at the prisoners and talk to them. Uh, and there was an awful lot of curiosity as well. There was also a lot of speculation in the press at the time. Because the Germans had a massive colonial army, they had colonies in Africa, there was a lot of speculation in the local papers that some of the soldiers might be black which was a, would never have been seen in North Tipperary or Temple Moor. So people came up in the hope of seeing some of the black soldiers from the German regiments, but um, they were known as far as I'm aware of. The conduct wasn't always positively received though, by the uh, locals. And on the 5th of September 1914, there was a comment in the local paper. It said that the conduct of the prisoners is very adversely commented on by local people. The prisoners are constantly throwing stones over the walls to the great danger of pedestrians. It went on to say that the Germans are nice boyos to be engaged in such behaviour, so they weren't too impressed at all. Um, local businesses obviously benefited from supplying the barracks because apart from the prisoners, you had the soldiers that were guarding who would have been several dozen members of the Lancaster Regiment. One enterprising local shopkeeper called Mr. Percy set up a store in the barracks yard, which was described as a dry canteen, meaning that he didn't serve alcohol, obviously. So he would supply the prisoners with cigarettes, coffee and chocolate, to the prisoners. And it's something that's probably hard to believe, but at that stage of the war, under the Hague and Geneva Conventions, the prisoners were actually paid the wage that they would receive in the army that they served in back home. So the German soldiers were actually paid every week, which is where they got the money to go to Mr. Percy's shop. And the British prisoners in Germany were being paid as well. Now, that didn't last for the duration of the war, but at that stage of the war, the conventions were being uh, upheld by both sides. Every day the prisoners were taken out for long walks out of the uh, barracks. Uh, they would generally go out to as far as Barnan and kind of go in a circle back, uh, but they were always under armed guard. Um, the officers were allowed to go out in pairs, but again, under guard as well. So they were taken out to get some exercise. I think it's important as well to stress that at this area of the war, there was very little hostility shown towards the prisoners over here anyway. A lot of people believed the propaganda that the war would be over by Christmas. And the horrors of the trenches hadn't really um, happened yet. And also as well, later on in the war, propaganda, which I'll deal with later on, the propaganda towards the Germans, kind of portraying them as what they called the beastly homes or whatever, um, hadn't really begun at this stage. So there was a kind of um, curious atmosphere and quite a friendly atmosphere between the locals, the Leinster soldiers and the German POWs. Uh, the POWs were kept very busy, they had to maintain the camp. They were out um, uh, painting, whitewashing, picking grass off the barrack square. A lot of the soldiers were also very skilled tradesmen from when we, before the war began. And they also laid a parquet floor in one of the convents of the town. A piece of that floor has now been moved 
when, the, when it was taken up a few years ago, it's in front of a side altar in the Catholic Church in Templemore. Unfortunately, there's, there's no plaque beside it, but um, maybe we can get that put up in the near future because it's one of the only known artifacts of um, the POWs. It's also rumoured that the POWs planted the trees which go down from the gate of the Garda College down the mile to the Catholic Church. Uh, and that's what we've been told, but again, that might be folklore or wishful thinking. One soldier of the Brandenburg Regiment did leave an artifact, and unfortunately it's, we don't know where it is these days, but he carved 17 verses of poetry on the shoulder blade of an ox, and he ended with the following verse. Even if we grow old, we shall never forget the splendid fool about hot and cold we got in Templemore. And he finished with a little having a go as well. The English are very brave and nothing to be afraid of. So, and obviously the prisoners had to pass their time by getting involved in crafts and working as well. The captured soldiers fairly quickly settled into a comfortable routine and there were no reported attempts to escape, even though I'm sure the option was there. The prisoners were well fed, accommodated and received parcels from home via the Red Cross. One POW was talking to a local RIC member and he commented that it would take a good many maintenance to get us out of the more barracks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was also the big technological news at the time as well that the RIC barracks, the post office and Richmond barracks had been connected by, the te by a telephone, which was, a, was big news back then. And it said in the local paper that on occasion the wires would surely get overheated with all the excitement. Uh, in a similar way to the British Army of the time, the, the Imperial German Army was very much class divided. Officers had their own quarters and were allowed to have soldiers of private rank as their servants or valets. And I found this remarkable document in the National Archives as well. It relates to the case of a man called Berthold Hilcher, who was a POW in the camp. Um, I don't know how this happened, but he was promoted to officer rank while he was a prisoner in Templemore. So the German government, of course, being a stickler for protocol and for efficiency, they contacted the American government and asked were they interested in the British government to make sure that this man was, and it says there, um, that he has been promoted and he should be um, moved to officers' barracks in, the, in uh, Templemore because he was now an officer. I should say at this stage of the war, America was still neutral. Uh, a lot of you will be aware that America only joined the war after the Lusitania was, was sunk. So at that stage, the American government and the Swiss government acted between the German and British governments for issues like this. So Berthold Hilcher was actually promoted and moved to an officer's uh, accommodation within the barracks. The reason um, how I know he was definitely moved is because this, the previous letter here refers to Turnhalle Barracks. Now, I have no <laughs> skill in the German language, but I understand that that means gymnasium in German. Now, what's now known as the Recreation Hall in the Garda College was originally the Barish Gymnasium, and these drawings date back to 1875 when it was first built. It looks quite different now in that the, the um, the tower up here is gone, and also this has been whitewashed over, so it's not really recognisable, but it is the same building. So because Berthold Hilcher was mentioned in Turnhalle Barracks, I know that it was definitely uh, kept inside of the gymnasium. Um, this photograph comes from the POW camp in, at Donington Park in England, but it's also of the, of the gymnasium, so I'd imagine it looks much as the Templemore uh, officers' accommodation would have looked at uh, at the time. There is an interesting connection as well between Donington and Templemore camps, which I'll David later on in the presentation. Um, on the occasion of the College's birthday, it was reported that each of the prisoners lit 20, 16 candles for the occasion, meaning that over 36,000 candles would have been lit on the College's birthday, and that must be quite an impressive sight at the time. So again, these men were very keen to kind of keep up the normal um, activities that they would have done when they were back home, and I suppose it helped them to deal with the the issue of being kept as a prisoner and the psychological issues that go with that. Every day, as I mentioned earlier on, the prisoners were taken out for exercise, usually for a kind of a circuit to burn out and back. And these uh, wonderful paintings were done by a local historian, Joe Barry, and it, it's his interpretation of what this would have looked like. And it must have been an amazing sight for local people to see up to 2,000 German soldiers and sailors walking over the bridges and the small boreens around Templemore and the surrounding areas. They also marched to church every Sunday as well. Unfortunately, two of the POWs died while they were in captivity, uh, both of natural causes. Um, the first was a private Anton Gazerski, who died of diabetes in November 1914. This is the magazine of the RIC, and it, it reports on what they call the moving ceremony, which took place at the Catholic Cemetery in Templemore 
as shown in this next slide here. And this is a photograph taken of the funeral of Kwebe Gazerski in November 1914 in the Catholic Cemetery. It's quite uh, a dull photograph, but you can see here the coffin. He's surrounded by his you can see here the coffin. He's surrounded by his colleagues. In the back you have some more IC officers as well, and you also have uh, British soldiers as well, standing guard on it. And again, it's nice to know that all the uh, usual respects and protocols were paid, and he was uh, buried with the last post, and um, his colleagues were allowed to uh, go into the mass and, and uh, form a choir and play the organ. So there was a lot of respect shown by, uh, by the Leinster Regiment that were guarding him. The second POW who died was called Ludwig Spellerberg of the 12th Regiment. He died of food poisoning in January 1915. Uh, it was reported at the time that despite the best efforts of two local doctors and personnel from the Army Medical Corps Hospital in, in Richmond, Spellerberg died from what was called Potomane poisoning. Uh, it was suspected that he had taken food with him when he was captured, including German sausage, which had gone off and unfortunately killed him. Uh, the Spellerberg was buried in the Church of Ireland Cemetery in the Ross Cray Road in Templemore, and again there were full military honours provided by the Leinster Regiment. One of his colleagues played the organ and it was reported that over 500 of his comrades attended the ceremony. The story of the burials and memorials to both of the men that died are very interesting in their own right, and I just want to talk about them in, in more detail. One interesting fact is that when both men were being buried, there was a lot of um, curiosity in the local papers at the German custom, which was to take up a handful of dirt and drop it into the grave. And that's something that's quite common these days in Ireland. But at that stage, it was described as a custom peculiar to the German people, and it had never been seen here before. Um, these are the two headstones, as I mentioned, uh, and both of them had been designed and paid for by their comrades just after they had died. Um, they got together, they saved some of their money, they designed, and they were constructed by local stonemasons, so they're absolutely unique because they're, they're, they're quite different, and the design of them is, is as I said, absolutely unique in Ireland. Um, the men themselves were reinterred in Glen Cree back in the 50s, but the headstones have been left there, and the story behind that is interesting in its own right. Um, in 1927, the British government decided that after we had achieved a free state, it was about time that we started paying for things ourselves. So the British government wrote and said that under the Treaty of Versailles, it was now the responsibility of the, Brit the Irish government to maintain and mark the graves of enemy combatants under the treaty. The Office of Public Works took out the project and they started to catalogue and find out where these graves were because they were in different places around Ireland, um, insofar as they were known as the term that was used in the, the foil I've seen. But it was about 18 months before the Minister for Finance gave approval that the Irish government would pay for the maintenance uh, of headstones and also the erection of headstones if none had been laid to date. In 1930 the German government lost patience and uh, one of them visited Ireland and noted that the graves of these two men, Gazerci and Spellerberg, were obliterated with weeds, as he said. He complained to the Free State Government about this, uh, but it took until 1937, but the OW finally um, took it on board and they made sure that each local authority took responsibility for the graves and they were cleaned up. The German ambassador wrote to Tishok de Valera at Christmas in 1937, thanking him for his efforts on the matter, but he did point out that it had taken several years to get it done, so he had to have a little go as well. The OPW made these sketches of the headstones at the time, and both markers are said remain today. Although in 1959 the remains of the men themselves were removed from Templemore and taken to the, the German cemetery in Glen Cree. Um, the marker on the Spellerberg grave in the Church of Ireland Cemetery is exactly as it was in 1915, and the inscription is in German. But um, the headstone on the right here of Kazerski actually has a different name on, on the grave now, which is why it took me a long time to find it, and it took a lot of detective work on my part, because I spent days scouring the graveyards for the headstone of, of a private Kazerski, but I couldn't find it. And then I was told by uh, one of our uh, local staff that the gravestone had been reused. And the story behind that is actually a very, very nice story. The reuse of the headstone came about as a result of this letter, which was written in 1959 to Templemore man William Larkin from Parkview. And Mr. Larkin had taken it upon himself to look after the graves for, for several years. And um, when the remains were taken out of the graves, there was a concern that the headstones would be removed as well. But Mr. Larkin wrote to the Volksbund, which is the General War Graves Commission, 
and he asked that the headstone should be allowed to remain in the cemetery and also the Protestant cemetery as well because of their unique designs and also to make sure that the two men that died were remembered and that the, the presence of the POWs in Templemore would not be forgotten. He got a reply back from the Volksbund, which was very nice, and it said that we give you sincerest thanks for this proof of your pure charity and in the names of the unknown relatives of these men as well. So it's one of those nice little gestures that happens, and again, it's, it tells us to remember that these men uh, were in Templemore in the first place. I visited the German military cemetery in Glen Creek recently, and it's an absolutely beautiful spot in the Dublin Mountains, between Paris Court and Glen Delap. And if you ever get the occasion to go up there, it's well worth it. Um, the graves of all German uh, military personnel who died in the First or the Second War. Uh, in the Second World War, some German planes crashed in Ireland, and the men that died uh, are buried in Glen Creek as well. So all German military graves are now up in this lovely cemetery in Glen Creek with the cross up here and then the gravestones down here. I also managed to find the two grave markers of, of Anton Gazerski and Ludwig Spellerberg. And the graveyard is looked after by the um, Commonwealth War Graves Commission and the British Legion uh, and, and on behalf of the German government and obviously with the OVW as well. And I think it's a nice thing to see that such commemorations still take place. And there is a ceremony every year to commemorate these men in which the relatives are invited over. So getting back to the prisoners in Temple Moor, at Christmas 1914 it was reported that the number of presents received from the Fatherland are beyond counting. So um, they got packages from home via the Red Cross. The local folklore has it that some of the POWs who were skilled craftsmen made wooden toys which were handed out to local children through the barbed wire. And it seems despite the fact that there was a war on, there was an awful lot of humanity displayed on both sides. It was also reported, there was a lot of curiosity, that the German uh, prisoners were singing uh, Christmas carols, which was, you know, the, the whole model of Christmas that we have now, of Christmas trees and presents, it's very much a Victorian thing. And a lot of it goes back to the fact that Queen Victoria married Prince Albert, who was German. And so he brought a lot of the German traditions to, to the UK as it was, and this was one of them, the idea of carol singing, Christmas trees, and exchanging presents. Um, so apparently they had a quite a nice Christmas, despite the circumstances they were in. Just after Christmas, this interesting article appeared in the local paper. It showed that the German abbot of Buckfast Abbey in London had visited Mount St. Joseph's and Ross Gray to give a retreat. He then travelled on to the camp of Town of Moor and heard confessions from the Catholic POWs. So it's nice to know that their spiritual welfare as well as their practical needs were also being looked after while they were in captivity. Um, obviously to pass the time, the prisoners were prolific letter writers and some of them have survived. And they'll turn up in the hobby of stamp collecting or uh, philosophy, where sometimes the letters from POWs will turn up amongst people that collect stamps for a hobby. And I have a couple of examples here that I've come across. It's very rare to get one from Temple Moor, but this is one example. A soldier called Christian Sonneman sent this letter to his family, and he said that today I send you heartfelt regards to the cold centre of Ireland, which he was right on that one. Uh, this is the end of our journey, which will be our home until the end of the campaign. Unknown to Christian Sonneman at the time, he would in fact only spend a few more weeks in Temple Moor before moving on. Another POW called Hildebrandt wrote this letter to um, the wife of a colleague of his in December. He said, I just received your postcard which shows to my grief that you were left in uncertainty about the destiny of your beloved husband. I hope you received a good message in the meantime. And you can imagine that when people were made prisoners of war, it would take months for their families to find out that they were safe. And obviously for that period they were left they would have just received notification that their loved one was missing, and it could take months for the Red Cross to send a prisoner list um, back to home. Uh, and it's understandable that, that it could take several months at the time. The next few photographs show some of the daily life that went down in the POW camp, such as Temple Moor, although uh, I don't think these two were taken in an English camp. The first photo shows a, a very comfortable looking and distinguished officer with the uh, which was very common at the time, obviously, fantastic facial hair and mustaches. Uh, with, with the Imperial Army. He seems quite comfortable in his hut. He's got packets of cigarettes here, he's got a um, bed, tea, and photographs of his loved ones on the wall. The next one shows two officers outside their hut in the snow. This photograph could have been taken in Temple Moor because it's quite familiar, but it shows prisoners playing a game called scat, which is a kind of version of bowling, which is very popular amongst prisoners. One interesting thing to note here is that it's quite hard to see, but on the back side of this man's uh, trousers, there's a yellow circle. 
and they were sewn on to all uniforms of POWs. It, it, but the intention was that if they ever escaped, they would be easily identifiable by the yellow circle, which is about 8 to 10 inches wide. And it was sewn on their backsides and also on the back of their, their uh, tunics as well. So they obviously had plenty of time to play games with each other as well. They also made time for fun as well. This is a photograph taken of the Donington camp, but the same thing happened in Templemore. The, these men are dressing up and uh, clowning around for a concert that was put on by the POWs. And I suppose it was a very good way of coping with the barrel warrior disease of captivity that I mentioned earlier on. The next few photographs are of particular interest because they are specific to Templemore. And I made contacts. One thing I've been trying to do for years is to find some of the, the descendants of these men and talk to them about it. And I actually tracked down a guy called Ulf Boardman who now actually lives, uh, lucky for him, he lives most of the year in Hawaii and the other part of the year he lives in Berlin. His father was this man, Simon Richard Boardman, who was a POW in Templemore until he was moved over to the UK in 1915. This photograph shows Simon Boardman uh, in uniform just before the war broke out in the summer of 1914. The next photograph shows Simon here, uh, that's him there on the front right, that would remember again colleagues from his regiment just before the war broke out during the summer of 1914. The next two photographs show Simon when he was at the Donington camp, posing in this one with a in and with two colleagues, one of whom is his cousin. So it was quite common as I said to deal with the boardroom that the POWs would form bands and entertain each other and also play in church choirs. And this is a more formal portrait of Simon uh, posing for a picture that was to be sent home to his family in Germany. The last picture here, which is my favourite, is the Donington Hall POW camp football team. And they would play against the guards that were, the, that were their captors in Donington Hall. Simon is shown here, but one of the most remarkable things is that um, after the war he came home with the football in this photograph and the family still have it. So his son has that football over in Hawaii. And a few years ago, um, Ulf visited Templemore because he wanted to see where his father had been detained. And he told me in a recent email that um, when he was in Templemore, he bought an outdoor lantern, which he keeps at his house in Hawaii. And he said every time he turns on the lantern, he's reminded of his father and also of the town of Templemore. So it's one of those nice little stories. And this brings me to, the, I suppose, the really interesting part of the story, and the last bit of it. What happened to these men? And how did they leave Templemore? And what circumstances? And of course, there was one version given of events which was utterly untrue and was covering the real reason. The first mention of the removal of the prisoners was in the RIC magazine in March 1915. And it says here that um, it says that the official reason for the move is that the sanitary conditions in the barracks were not up to the required standard of the Geneva Convention. And also, because there were huge numbers of Irishmen enlisting now in the Munster Regiment and the Leinster Regiment to go to the front, that the barracks was needed to train those men. But that's actually not, not the case. The, it went on to say here that the men were being transferred to what they called a concentration camp in Manchester, which obviously has, has residences from another period. It was reported that their stick and span appearance when they left Templemore showed a marked contrast to their bedraggled state on arrival last August. Um, the captured soldiers were not too keen to leave Richmond. One, the RIC magazine again reported that many were the regrets uttered at the thoughts of being taken away from comfortable quarters, and as they call them, the goody, nicey people of Templemore. So it seems that despite the fact that they were POWs, they had a relatively pleasant stay. Um, the real reason for their transfer to England, though, as I said, is nothing to do with the fact that the barrier was needed for the war effort, and it's far more to do with the cause of, of the Irish independence. Obviously, you've all heard of Roger Casement, who was executed for treason. Casement had been in the USA when the war broke out, and he went to Germany to try and, um, with the support of various Irish American groups. And obviously, there was a hope amongst the Republican movement, the volunteer movement, that the Germans would come on side with the volunteers against the British. Um, and that was a fair of hope of them at the time. And as we know, there were guns and ammunition landed from the Germans in Ireland. But the Germans were, were a bit ambivalent about it. They had enough on their hands as it was. But Casement actually went to Germany with the intention of raising what was called an Irish Brigade. The Irish Brigade was to be raised from Irishmen that were in the British Army and that were POWs in Germany. And some Republicans believed that they could actually get a couple of thousand of these men 
to join the Irish Brigade, come back to Ireland, and maybe with the assistance of the German government, um, get involved in, I suppose, the Easter Rising, as it happened later on. Um, this is a, a remarkable photograph taken at the Zessen camp in Germany in 1915, and it shows members of the brigade were splendid in their new uniforms. Members of the brigade were splendid in their new uniforms. So these here you have a mixture of Irish men in the Irish brigade and obviously some of their German um, counterparts who were interpreters. Um, but there was a very, very bad, or understandably I suppose, given that these men were in the British Army. Um, there was a very low take-up to join the Irish Brigade, and it was estimated that only about 50 actually tried to enlist. Some of them were brought back to Ireland um, later on and uh, got involved in the rest of page during the War of Independence. But again, it's a remarkable period in Irish history. And what's the link here with Temple Moore? Well, the link is this document which I found in the National Archives, and it's a report from the Special Branch of the Royal Irish Constabulary. It reveals that Pierce McCann would be well known to a lot of you, a local man, um, and who Temple Moore Barracks was named after, uh, after independence as McCann Barracks, and actually the, def the Reserve Defence Forces part of Temple Moore is still called McCann Barracks. The RSC Special Branch Report says here that McCann had attempted to visit the POWs in Temple Moore, and he had tried to get in and visit the Germans that were detained there. And it also says he was described as giving out anti-recruiting and pro-German leaflets. There was insufficient evidence for prosecution by the RIC, but he was closely monitored by, by them and also the G Division of the DMP. He was categorised as being very suspicious in nature, and it was also reported that volunteers under McCann's command had formulated a plan to attach Richmond, attack Richmond barracks and release the prisoners. So there was a nightmare scenario where the German prisoners might be broken out of the barracks, armed with weapons from Germany, and then they would get involved in what became the Easter Rising. And that's, uh, it also said in the report here that McCann was intimately acquainted with extremists such as P.H. Pierce, the O'Rahilly, Thomas McDonough, and the Plunkets, who were categorised as violent extremists by the RIC. So to my mind, there's absolutely no doubt that it was the activities of McCann and trying to get in and visit the prisoners, combined with the fact that the authorities were well aware that Casement was in Germany trying to raise an Irish brigade, that directly led to the removal of the prisoners from Temple Moor. They were initially taken to a new uh, camp called Limford Mill, which is at Lee on the outskirts of Manchester. Some of them, such as Simon Borkman that I mentioned earlier on, were moved to Donington Hall and other camps around, around the country and split up. Journalists from um, Manchester, when they heard the prisoners were coming to their town, were sent over to Temple Moor to, I suppose, have a look at these men that were coming to visit them. Uh, they described Temple Moor as being the quietest place on earth. But when the POWs first arrived in England, they were depicted very negatively in local newspapers. And I mentioned earlier on about the attitude towards the Germans when they arrived first, but it was quite different in England. And if you look at some of the propaganda posters of the time, they're, they're fairly. Uh, the vitriol is fairly obvious. Here you can see a German soldier depicted as a, as a, I suppose, an ape, carrying a woman who was symbolic of Belgium or uh, France, and carrying a, a, a club here. And also here you have a German nurse supposedly refusing aid and water to a wounded soldier. And you see, one of the ideas behind this was to portray the Germans uh, in such a negative. Uh, fashion that it would encourage people to enlist and dehumanise the enemy, which is a thing that is normally done as part of propaganda. Um, and it, it, it began with these virulent uh, posters as well, and it said the spy fever was still, was still uh, prevalent around the place. There was also as well a lot of effort made to recruit Irishmen on the basis that German soldiers had been involved in alleged atrocities in Belgium and France, particularly in Belgium against Catholics. And that was used very heavily to encourage Irishmen to join the army, to fight for other smaller Catholic nations. And a lot of them joined, did join in great numbers. Um, the newspaper commentary about these men before they arrived and as they arrived was, was quite uh, shocking uh, compared to the treatment they got in, in, in Ireland. One newspaper said they had a villainous look about them, which satisfies one of their being capable of committing every conceivable kind of atrocity. The next paper said that we are sorry to think that for a couple of years the pure air of respectability will be tainted with the breath of these specimens of the scrapings of hell. 
pretty, uh, pretty nasty stuff. They get all parts of the, the, the plan to dehumanise these men and make them the enemy. Uh, as I said, anti-German sentiment was very strong in England, and of course, at this stage, the war had been going on for over a year. The trenches, the, the slaughter of the trenches had started to come home to, to people in Ireland and England, and obviously the attitude towards the enemy had changed dramatically. The men such as these, and this is a photograph of the men that had been in Templemore arriving in Manchester. They were employed working in local mines, factories and farms under very harsh conditions. As I said earlier on, they didn't have to work in Templemore apart from maintenance of the barracks, but in England they were brought out to the mines, the factories, the quarries every day and worked um, in very severe conditions. And it, it, it's, I suppose it's no coincidence that a total of 13 prisoners were shot dead during escape attempts from the League camp in the years that followed. And they were not actually released until 1919, uh, well after the war had ended. The men that died in Manchester were buried here at the German Military Cemetery, which is located in Staffordshire at a place called Cannock Chase. It's quite similar to the one in the then Korea that the intention is to have one place where all Germans were buried so that the families had one place to go to rather than being spread all over the, all over the country. The Lee Journal of May 1919 carried a story about the departure of the last prisoners and they hadn't changed their attitude or opinion at all in the intervening period. It said that most people would heave a sigh of relief at the prospect of a town free from the presence of such unwelcome guests. So they were glad to see the back of them. Um, I came across this a couple of years ago as well. An English playwright called Neil Duffield wrote a play about, uh, called Ilford Mill, which is based on events that took place in Manchester at the time. I contacted him a while ago and I thought it might be a nice idea to maybe have the play performed in Templemore during the centenary year of 2014 and actually do the play in the recreation hall, which was the barracks that the officers were detained in. And the ice in the cave is supposed to be to have some of the family members of the descendants arrive over. So we're, we're hoping to do something. Uh, there's a lot of anniversaries coming up obviously over the next few years in Ireland and we're hoping to do something uh, special in 2014. It'll be 50 years since the scar the training moved from Dublin in 2014. It'll be 200 years since the barracks first opened and it'll be 100 years since not only the Great War began but also of the arrival of the prisoners. So hopefully we can do something special in 2014 to commemorate all of those events. Um, there's very little evidence that remains these days about the time of the men being in Templemore, just to come to the last couple of slides now. But one interesting thing I did find was in the Garden Review magazine in July 1975. It said that a West German visitor, of course at that time they had West German and East German, they came to Templemore and visited the Garden Training Centre. Ernest Thomas, an uncle of one, had been a POW here in 1914 and 15. They enjoyed a tour of the centre and brought some items back to Ernest who was still hailing the party at over 80 years of age. So even um, back then there was still curiosity about the time that the prisoners were here. I mentioned earlier on about the piece of parquet flooring in the Catholic Church. And there were, uh, I know there were a lot of things made and built by the prisoners, but the only thing that I, the only known artifact that survives apart from the floor of the church is this wonderful item here. It's a very, very simple tin, military issue water canteen, but it was hand engraved by one of the prisoners with a nail or some other sharp implement um, by a POW called Albert Skurda during October 1914. On the front of the bottle you can see the eagle, the double-headed eagle which is on the front of the spike helmet uh, that I showed you earlier on. And on the rear of it there's a, a detention souvenir of a uh, prisoner war camp. Um, but but he, I suppose I like the subtleties here. He talks about a prisoner of war in England, Temple Moor, Brackets, Ireland. So maybe somebody pointed out, you're not actually in England, you're in Ireland, and he put it in brackets here, making a distinction that even though he's a prisoner of war, he was in Temple Moor, which was in Ireland, and it's October 1914. Um, and that brings me to the end of the, the presentation, everybody. The one thing, as I said, oh, with the anniversaries coming up, it's an interesting time. I also like to mention as well that um, Tip FM are doing a radio documentary about the POWs I've been discussing with them over the last while, and hopefully it will be. It's being produced at the moment, and the producer has actually gone to Manchester to talk to local people there. So it should, if you keep an ear out for that, it should be hopefully broadcast sometime early in the new year. And with that, I'd like to say uh, that's the end of the presentation. I'll be happy to deal with any questions that you have.